All right, high rollers, what a treat today. One of the biggest voices in darts, a PDC frontman, you might say, referee and caller, a guy who's been up close and personal for some of the most dramatic moments in the game's history. And I was thinking about it this morning as I put my questions together. You know, there's pressure on the players, of course, nerves, tension, it's a game of millimeters, but there's also pressure on the callers. I would have to imagine... It's immense. I believe they are the unsung heroes of the PDC. Our guest today is one of the best, and nobody, I mean nobody, belts out a 180 like this guy does. Russ Bray is with us. Russ, welcome to the show. Thanks for being our high roller today. Absolute pleasure, Derek. It's uh, great to be on the show. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. I want to know, how have you been coping with lockdown? I guess the real question is, are you favoring the Bloody Mary or Thatcher's Gold these days? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it's been a little bit of all of that. <laughs> the areas, the Thatcher's Gold, the Magnus. To be honest with you, the weather's been amazing here during the lockdown that we've had for the last three months. The odd couple of days that have not been too clever. I'm very, very lucky. I'm a lucky guy. I live on a, I live on a farm, so uh, which is not a working farm, but it's like a small holding, couple of stables. We've got a whole couple of horses here as well, so I've got a decent amount of space in and around me, and. To be honest with you, it's the amount of travelling I do. It's been it's been lovely to have had a bit of time off at home to get the jobs done that I haven't done in the last twenty years. So uh, my wife has been pretty happy with that. But uh, coping with the lockdown, I, to be fair, it hasn't been too bad for me. I've been I'm one of the lucky people. It sounds like your surroundings are serene. So in a way, yes, get away from work, back to nature, and just uh, focus on some new things. Refresh. Big time, yeah. I, I, like I say, I, I live um, on the very outskirts of a village in the UK. So we're just, I'm just totally surrounded by farms. So, that, you know, there's no real houses as such um, or, or town type thing, you know. Now, I'm very much out in the countryside and... The part of the world I live in, in the, in the southeast of England here, the skies of a night are absolutely magnificent. You know, when you get a clear sky, you can see everything. It really is quite incredible. We even see the space shuttle go zooming across the sky the other week. Wow. It was good. Yeah. Now, you are the darts ambassador for William Hill. I know you're keeping busy that way. Things are happening on that front as well. You've been busy getting the shops open up again and safely. We're living in strange times right now. <laughs> Very, very. Well, my wife actually works for William Hill, and um, they had to put some screens up and things like that and put the social dis distancing discs down and prepare the shops and uh, to help her out. Bear in mind, I'm home. I'm not doing anything as such. Help her out. I went, uh, went to the shop with her and, you know, just helped her out with some bits and pieces. But um, I actually sponsored an ambassador for William Hill anyway, so it was... Uh, you know, it was sort of double whammy, really. It was, it was, it was good fun to do, that, to be honest with you, to be able to go out and do something. Where are we with the darts? By the way, the PDC has done a fantastic job with PDC Home Darts. Live streams have been great with Dan Dawson. The players have stepped up. Darts has really been the envy of the sports world during lockdown because there's still been action. The sports betting world, too, I might add. Having said that, though, I miss you guys. I, I miss the callers. I miss the intensity up there. I miss the fans, yeah. the commentators. It's just not the same. No, no, I mean, to be honest with you, the PDC have made the best of what is, you know, I mean, a horrible, horrible situation that the world's been in with this coronavirus, you know, it's been absolutely awful. But the beauty of the game of darts is, as we've seen, it can be played indoors. You know, you don't need auditoriums to actually add, I mean, there's been nine darters and all sorts, to have wonderful, wonderful games. And it is very, very, very much a, you know, a sporting icon icon in this in this world you know it's um one of the few sports that can actually do indoors that is accessible to everybody in the world and uh and a great show they put on too and, and like you say the guys all stepped up to the plate lost a little bit of tradition obviously but not being on a stage with the markers there and a the caller there and obviously your commentators but in the circumstances absolutely magnificent well, with regards to the layoff during lockdown, it's great that the players are getting some competitive action too, so that when everything does open up and everything resumes, they're back to the one 100 plus averages. Yeah, definitely. 
definitely. But you can see where the guys have been practicing hard anyway. Modus have actually put on a tournament as well during the uh, during the lockdown, and that that's been very very successful for for those guys there. You know, it, it's kept everybody interested. All the dart players, you know, they do practice every day and um, to be the very very best to be great at what they do. And it's given them that incentive. So actually, they've never really come away from the game. It's still given them that competitive edge, which is what you need. You can practice, you know, I mean, I can stand here and practice for the next year every day. But to actually play in a competition on a competitive edge is different again. You know, I might be hitting 180 tons I'm here, but if all of a sudden I've got to do it against someone at that one given time, that makes a heck of a difference. So these guys have still had that competition edge. So once we do get back on the TV, which I'm sure will be very, very shortly, then you'll see these guys at that level, at the 100-plus average level, you know, the big shots out and the nine dancers. Yeah, it's really brought darts to the forefront, all the other sports on the back burner, so it's getting more exposure. That's a good thing. We're on the line with The Voice, folks, at Russ180 on Twitter. I don't usually talk politics on the show, Russ, but is it true... Uh -huh. You are considering a run for Parliament? I wish you all the best on that if you are. I mean, that's a big, life-changing decision. <laughs> I, I can really rest assure you, Derek, I'm not. No, I don't know where you read that, but absolutely, I, I've got to be honest, I'm not a very political person at all. You know, I, I go with the flow. Um, as I say, I, I, I generally stay out of politics, and I leave that to the people that know what they're talking about. And uh, unfortunately, on that sort of line, I really don't. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. See, I don't always trust Wikipedia. I saw it on Wikipedia today doing research. Oh, right. I thought I'd have to ask, so you might want to check that out. Now, outside the PDC, I know you do some voice work, voiceovers and the like. Did you always have the raspy voice? I mean, have you known since a young age that yours stands out because it does? Yeah, um, yeah I guess so. Yeah, my voice was always deeper than the other kids at school, you know, in general. But to have actually made a living out of it, i.e. by doing the calling of the dots, and never even never even entered my head. You know, I got into I got into voiceovers by doing the darts, and uh, you know, purely by accident. Again, it's um, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I love doing. I love going in the studio and sitting there and doing the bits and pieces. But uh, and I've got a fantastic voice agent, um, Loud and Clear Voices in London here. So uh, you know, it, it, it's it's another swing to your bow. It's another you know trig off the tree sort of thing. Yeah, and when I was doing research this morning, uh, you know I'm a big fan of the rock group ACDC. I equate your story <laughs> to that of theirs. Legendary frontman Bon Scott only became the lead singer when the other guy failed to show up one night, so he took the mic and the rest is history. One of the all-time greats. How did you find your way up there on that stage? I know your debut was 1996, if I'm correct, at the World Match Play in yep. Blackpool. That's absolutely correct. Um, how I got it, it was on a very similar similar vein. I was playing county darts. I used to play darts. I don't play darts now, but I play county darts uh, for Hertfordshire, one of our counties over here in the in the A team. And the caller, a guy called Steve Smiley, never turned up because the county scene is actually done the same as you would go to an auditorium. You've got a stage, you've got your markers, and you've got your caller. And the caller never turned up. Well, I turned around and said, well, to help out, I'll call a couple of games and then get myself ready to play my match. And when I walked off, someone said to me, I said it all right. And I, I really, really enjoyed, really enjoyed calling. I enjoyed doing it. And I eventually became one of the county callers. There was two of us, another guy called Trevor Wood. And he was the main one in charge at the time. Then you had to split in dance. You had to split with the PDC or WDC as it was then and the BDO. And this is where my politics doesn't really come into it because what they were saying was at the time, if you was to do anything with the WDC, then you would be banned from everything within the darts, within the BDO. Wow. And yeah, well, I'm, like I say, I'm not a political man. I mean, darts has been my fun. It's been my pleasure. It hadn't been my work at that given time. And um, I was eventually asked by the PDC, was I interested in being a reserve referee? To two of the most fantastic referees there's ever been, Freddie Williams and Bruce Bentley, um, who were iconic again at that time. Was I be, would I be interested in joining the PDC and being a, a reserve referee? And I said, yes, I would love to. I went up to Blackpool, called two games there in 96, it was July 96. It was on the Sunday night. It was before they 
televised it live on the Sunday. Um, so they actually televised it, then showed a recording of it on the Monday when they went live. So my first two games was one. The first one was with John Lowe, who had hit a nine data, and my second match was with Paul Lim. The only two guys at that time that had hit nine darts. And, you know, the nerves and, and, and you mentioned pressure earlier on, um, was absolutely horrific. I mean, you've got your heart thumping in your ear. You're praying you don't make a mistake. Um, and then I walked off of those. Um, Tommy Cox, bless him, who's uh, sadly died there, sort of a director or one of the founders of the PDC. Uh, he took me one side and turned around and said, um, we're not having a reserve referee. And I thought, oh, dear, I've blown this. He said, we're having three referees. Welcome to the PDC. Wow. And, uh, that's where, and that's how mine literally came about. Purely playing darts and the caller not turning up. A bit similar to the ACDC fella. You know, his mate, that, the guy never turned up to sing, he sung, got the gig. Unbelievable. So I got to ask you this then. When you're in your quiet moments, they're out there in nature on the farm. Do you ever yep. contemplate fate? I, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I really don't. I really don't. Again, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that way inclined. I'm not that style of person. You know, it's. Uh, I wake up in the morning. I'm alive. Oh, wow, what a great day this is going to be. And that's how I try and treat myself and treat life. You know, doesn't always work that way. Obviously, you know, being a realist. But uh, that's how I. That's how I look at life in, in that way. Well, that's a great approach. Now, I did mention pressure off the top. Certainly, the players feel it up there, and you mentioned it there. You must as well. I mean, you don't want to disrupt the flow of the match or throw a player off at a crucial time. You want to keep decorum on stage. You've got to handle the crowd, and all of this while you're trying to calculate math problems in your head at lightning quick speed. I mean, how do you approach this game and your role as referee? Well, it, it, it becomes part and parcel of of what you do. Obviously, once the guy's thrown the darts, I believe added them up correctly. You called the score correctly. Again, you are looking for if there is a misdemeanour, which very, very rarely you will see that they might encroach on the on the exclusion zone or something like that, or they might have a few words with each other on the stage. That's happened in the past, but you know, in the main, you're up there. Um, you're also up there to entertain as well. You know, I mean, it, it, you don't start being just you know, 126. But, I mean, it's it, a bit boring. You know, it, 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 you try and make it a little bit more exciting with the call. You know, it's, it's people like Kurt Bevins, he's unique 180 up and down. And, you know, and Georgie Noble, we've all got different styles. You know, and, and, and that's what makes it entertaining. That's what makes a game entertaining. You got, you know, George Noble called in the next game. Fabulous. He's a totally different style to Russ Bray, as I am totally different style to Kurt Bevin and Paul Hinks. You know, so it, 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 you're a big role up there. And we've all, I mean, we'll go on absolutely fabulous. We'll sit down and talk about the various bits and pieces and the games and all the such like. And everything falls into place. Everything slots in. If the crowd, oh, say, they're a bit noisier there at night, you know what I mean? You have to keep it keep on top of them, keep them quiet, and you know, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, the best of all the plates, you know, that type of thing. You always sit and talk, like, oh, God, you know, the crowd a bit quiet, they're all darts enthusiasts, so at the end of the day, you haven't got a lot, you haven't got to worry about them. Yeah, it, 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 it just becomes part and parcel of what you do. You don't, you don't really particularly think about anything in particular, other than basically getting the scores right, you know, and make sure, that, and make sure you call okay. You know, the rest of it sort of slots into place, really. But again, that comes up experience, I suppose. Now I've been doing it obviously 20 years, over 20 years. And, uh, you know, I don't get nervous now. I don't get nervous at all. I get excited for the game that I'm going to be calling, as oh. opposed to nerves. So, you know, you get someone like uh, when Ted Everts played um, Fallon Sherrick in the World Championships, you know. Everyone, it's, it's a tasty game because of the media interest on it. It's huge. You know, we've got a young lady there playing. Uh, a woman has never won a world championship match against a, a fella and um, you know of course everything was there so I mean pressures was on those guys uh, unlike me I just had to come yeah. yeah that's great when you wake up you know you're going to the stage and you look forward to it you're excited about it yeah. it's not a job it's yeah. fun exactly exactly uh, and like I say what used to be my pleasure my, what, I, what I used to pay to go and do play darts cool darts even in the early days back in the early 90s um you know, you'd pay to, to, to call or you'd pay. I'll get paid for it now. 
Um, so it's, it's like being a professional footballer. You know, who's good at football as a kid, and all of a sudden you make your living out of being a footballer or a rugby player or American football or ice hockey, as, as you guys do you know, main thing out there with you boys. You know, so it's, um, like I said to you, very early doors. I'm, I'm the luckiest man in life. Well, one of the things that I like about the PDC, besides darts being a fantastic sport to watch, is the way it's worked its magic in promoting the game. One of the things it does that I really enjoy is that it allows its employees to become personalities. And you mentioned it there. I mean, you, John McDonald, the entire crew, what they've done with respect to the Christmas commercials, that stuff is gold. <laughs> Hugh Ware is active with the Rainbow Laces campaign. You were the ref in the PDC's first ever video game. Noble, you mentioned. Bevins, you mentioned. These guys are characters now. That's encouraged, and I like that. Oh, it's great. I mean, it's great for us because obviously outside of PDC work, we get work elsewhere. I, I work an awful lot with one of my best mates is Keith Dellen, in 1983, chairman of the world. Uh, me and him have worked a corporate company now for the last 16 years, which is sort of pretty much unheard of, but we, we're working with them all the time. So, of course, people know who I am. People obviously know who Keith is. Um, so it makes it a cracking night. And that's the same with George, George Noble. He'll go out and do his exhibitions with you know various players at odd times. Everyone knows who George is. Everyone knows who Kirk is. Everyone knows who Paul is. And like you say, the PDC have given us that freedom to be able to make us celebrities in our own right. And um, that's something very, very grateful for. You know, you, you're not just an official on the stage. But, and to be honest, it's the same with that mark. It's the same with the lads up there that are marking. You know, most of the people see these guys, and you go to an exhibition. I do one in Leeds every year, which is up in the north to me, uh, up in the north of England. It's called the Dazzler, and we have Gary Wood there, who's, who's I mean, me and Gary have, have, have called a mark all over the world, literally. We've done nine daughters in South Africa. We've done nine daughters in Australia. Um, he, you know, he's one of the most well-known markers on the circuit. And people know who he is. So the PDC have allowed that to happen. But of course, so it's got with the coverage of the TV and bits and pieces, you know. So it's, it's, it's been brilliant for us all. You talk about the styles of the various callers. Has the 180 call been the same throughout your career or have you tweaked it a tad over the years? <laughs> well, it's probably been tweaked over the years as I've got older. I'll be honest, when I first started, I smoked. I, I, I haven't smoked now in over 10 years, um, or creeping up 10 years. Um, but I, I used to smoke, so uh, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I used to last about three or four days of a tournament, and then I was trying to put honey and lemon down my throat because I was getting all really broken. Never actually lost my voice bar once, but it was a struggle. Now I can do a complete tournament, you know, I'll do a two week tournament if I needed to, and it wouldn't bother me, I wouldn't worry about it. But yeah, my 180 is. My 180's changed. I think there's something on YouTube or somewhere that, you know, the different calls that I suppose, 180's, which I haven't actually seen. I've seen it up there, but I haven't actually seen it myself. So, uh, you know, you look at early footage, somewhat early footage, and, um, yeah, it, it has changed a little bit, I'm sure. Well, you know I'll be YouTube searching right after this interview to check that out. I haven't seen it either. I'm wondering, though, with respect to the 180 call, what is it that yep. gets people so revved up? I mean, it's one of the most important shots in darts, obviously the biggest score. The checkout call, though, that's important too. Maybe even more important, right? Because especially if it's a biggie and a big moment, you're scoring for show, but the doubles, they're for dough. Absolutely, Bobby George said that many, many, many years ago. You know, it's, it's one eight for show, doubles for dough. Um, but one eight is the highest you can go. It's, it's, it's a maximum. It's the perfect shot. It's the perfect shot leading up to your finish. And uh, you know, the first arc goes in, the second arc goes in, and you hear the crowd. Is it, is it, and then bang, yeah, all bang. The referee bangs out the one eighty. All the crowd are all up, all their signs showing and everything. It's a build up. This is part of the sport now. It's part of the sport and the crowd. It gives the crowd something to get involved with as well, rather than just sitting there and watching. It gives them something to get involved with. And then, like you say, if they're on a big finish, which the dancing purists in the crowd will understand, the general guy that's gone there just to have a party time and all the rest of it, he won't know 135 that he's gone, you know, balls away, you know, gone that way, balls eye treble, 15 double top. He won't know that. He, he, he'll leave game shot and he will applaud that. The lead up to it, unless it's a one seventy or something, they you know they don't generally understand. Right. The one eighty, everybody knows. Right. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering. I'm thinking of all those young fans out there with the 180 signs and how many you've signed. That's got to be a real collectible nowadays. I received a couple of <laughs> questions on Twitter, Russ. One from uh, Liam Martin who asks, your favorite ever match to referee and why. Then another from Charlie Gray who wanted to know your favorite final Similar questions, both Liam and Charlie, good friends of the show. You've already answered yep. this on Twitter. Same match, 2007, Taylor v. Barneveld, the world final. Yeah, yeah, absolutely terrific. I, I had an awful lot. Uh, there was a lot of things on it. It was the very last PDC tournament, a world championship at the iconic Circus Tavern, uh, for one, because then the following year we went to Ali Pali. Taylor took a very, very early lead. 3-1, one, 4-1 one up, I think he was, something like that. Barney then brought it back. I then went on for the second half of the final. And the act, the game itself was absolutely terrific. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And then to go to the sudden death leg in the final set of a world championship was just fabulous. Taylor at 25 going for the bullseye to see who threw first. And that was the biggest thing. That was the biggest thing. Who's going to throw first? Because if you've got, you've got the advantage, obviously, throwing first. Taylor threw a 25. Um, Barney at bullseye, I believe. So he ended up with the throw. Taylor hit a 180 in the throw. Barney followed it. And then he took out, I think it was Tops to win the match um, from memory now. And uh, But the atmosphere, because Circus Tavern, everybody was virtually on the stage with it. No, that's how close everybody was. But the atmosphere, the tension, the pure sporting drama of that 2007 final was something I hadn't experienced before. Um, been pretty close since, but uh, I would certainly say that was probably the best match for me ever. And the best seat in the house, too. I mean, what a dream. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> what a dream. Yeah, I'm kidding. You mentioned it earlier. <laughs> With the tension and the big money, I mean, I see a day where it'll be a million pounds for the winner of the world oh. championship. And with so many players under the microscope, you don't see many problems now. But I gotta believe it's only a matter of time before something severe happens up there, like where there's an altercation. We've come close, but can you see that day, or do you think the rules safeguard against it? Now I can see the day of a million, a million pound for the winner. I mean, we're on half a million now. You know what I mean? We're halfway there now, right. which, is, which is, you know, uh, again, this day and age, with the sport of darts, it is just, it's incredible. It is incredible. But I can see, uh, probably not quite in the rest of my career, but I can certainly see half a million, uh, a million pound very much within the next maybe seven to ten years, that's for sure. Wow. Uh, that, that I firmly believe. Um, all cases on stage, I don't think so. Um, you know, it's, it, it, most things are pretty petty anyway, and I've dealt with and dipped in the bud immediately. So um, no, I, I, I don't. I don't think that'll be. I don't think that'll be an issue or a problem personally. You know, the referees are strong. We're strong enough with it. You know, the players confide in us anyway as well. So you know, again, it, it, it's um, working as a team up on the stage with the markers, myself, uh, and you've got the respect of the players, and you respect the players. So. Uh, no, I don't think, I don't think that'd be a problem. Well, that's good to hear on both fronts. Million pounds to the winner. What a showdown that would be. <laughs> uh, listen, Meryl Von Selm, a friend of the show at Asian Darts, she covers the darts scene over there beautifully. Send me a message to say that what you've done for Asian Darts has been simply amazing, that you're heavily involved, that you worked the Malaysian Open, gone all around Asia, the yeah. Philippines even, promoting the game, and you mentioned it yeah. just now, it is growing everywhere. Well, um, I, I do do the Asian tour, and I've done it for the last two years since its, it's conception, uh, with a guy, Joe May, and, and his wife, Ying. Yeah, it's, it's... The point I'm trying to make is, when you go somewhere like China, you know, which is the most populated country in the world. In China, you're going to find a Phil Taylor or Michael Van Gogh. There's going to be someone there. There will be, for sure. Uh, but it's not just a matter of finding them. Ace and Darts now, over the last two years, has boomed. It has gone massive. I look at it, we've only got to look at the World Cup last year. Japan got to the semi finals. So it's getting there it is getting there we've had two nine daughters in two years of the of the asian tour norma licked them from the philippines in the very first one we've done in korea and then um oh dear oh dear oh dear 
because she's not up to too far, I can't think of his name. Um, anyway, it's getting there. The dance, the standard. Makura Suzuki, the young lady, you know, she's getting quarterfinals in the men's tournament. Amazing. That's a, and she is, she is absolutely superb. She is absolutely superb. You know, so again, it, it, it's now getting in depth. It, it, it's always great to have your front runners. And once you start getting it in depth, which is what's happening with the Asian tour, and the standard is getting better and better and better, then, as I say, the other lad I was thinking of was Lawrence Logan. He was the other one at the $9 last year. It's getting better and better and better, and the standard's getting higher and higher and higher in depth. And, of course, with it happening like that, with the players playing each other week in, week out, it's, they're still playing to a very, very high standard. And that's the sort of tournament, the sort of competition you need. So that's, you know, my push out in Asia, for, for sure. I, done in, I went to India last year, I went to Calcutta. I uh, got invited out there. And, uh, oh, again, you look at the people there, that they, they try hard, they, they put on a wonderful show, um, and the standard is getting better. And that's what we want. And then it makes it, a whole lot better for when obviously you come to world championships. You're not going to be playing, you know, our top player is going to be playing a player, say, from wherever, and they're not going to be very good. That's not going to happen because the standard will be in there straight away. So when you get 96 players at the world championships, you've got 96 players that are more than capable of doing exceptionally well. And I'll say we'll win the tournament at this given time, but doing exceptionally well. well and that's it, what you want. It's incredible. And you talk about the standard. If, if within seven to ten years, it's a million pounds to the winner. Can you imagine the standard? I mean, scary in 20 oh. years' time. I mean, oh, my God. <laughs> How would you even get to the top? Everybody be so good. Now, before I let you go, I'm wondering yeah. if you have any opinion on what the best darts app on the market today is. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's the Rust Ray Dart Scorer Pro, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's been going for ten years now. And um, which is which is incredible. And um, again it's been the number one sports set, not just not just not just darts app, number one selling sports app on Apple. And it is just going through the roof. Even now, as I speak, it, it's, it's incredible. The guy that the, the guy that's done it, Andrew Aisbit from TIG, he um, he contacted me ten years ago and said, "Man, it said to me, you know, I'd like to I'd like to do a darts app for you, and, you know, scoring app." I said, "Okay, how much is it going to cost me?" He said, "It won't cost you nothing." He says, "I'll set it all up. I'll do it all." He says, "And then what we'll do is uh, we we'll put it out to Apple, put it out on Android eventually." He says, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. And, uh, well, as I say, it's just, for me, it's just been absolutely incredible. And it's got everything on it now. You can play each other now. I mean, I could physically play you. I could be playing indoors here. You could be playing over there in Toronto. And, you know, we could be competing against each other. So that's how the app's gone. And it's just been amazing. Well, wow, that's great. I really appreciate your time. This has been a real pleasure. Russ Bray, at Russ180 on Twitter. Referee extraordinaire, The Voice. Oh, can I get you to do a 180? Can I? Of course you can, mate. You ready? Yeah. I'll turn your levels down. One <laughs> 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 that is awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Russ Bray, appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for the interview, mate. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.